this conference and preparing for it, you know, it's really remarkable how the Lord inspires each of our speakers um, to craft the topics that we encourage them to speak on and how they often flow together. And as I mentioned earlier, my talk um, was slated to be this first talk right here after lunch. And it fell between Corey's presentation that you heard the last one of this morning and Cameron's who will be speaking after me. And it just so happened that the topic that I had been inspired with much earlier um, ended up being, I think, a really great bridge for these conversations. So my topic today is talking about the new and everlasting covenant and our covenant heritage, meaning where we have inherited our covenant blessings from and our covenant destiny. And I think that this, as I said, it's going to build off of a lot of what Corey has already spoken about, and it'll lead in really well to what Cameron will be talking about with us next. So in Malachi chapter four, verses five and six, it says, behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Now, when we read this, I think that we have um, an idea of Elijah returning, restoring the keys, the sealing power. Cameron will be expounding on that beautifully later. And perhaps we have an idea that there's meant to be some sort of emotional reconciliation between the ancients and the people today. Um, But I have always felt like there's something more. And gratefully, William Clayton was able to elaborate on what that was. Um, when he had written down this wisdom that he had received from Joseph Smith, William Clayton wrote, when speaking of the passage, I will send the prophet Elijah, Joseph said it should be read and he shall turn the hearts of the children to the covenant made with their fathers. This is absolutely profound to me as we've been talking today about some of the challenges that the Lord's people have faced when they've been presented with the opportunity to ascend and to return back into his presence. We have discussed how that has not been fulfilled on a group scale just yet, but that the Lord always extends his hand and continues to work with us on an individual basis. Covenants are central to that path and to the way that we are able to fulfill the opportunities that have been extended to us by our beloved Savior, Jesus Christ. In talking about our ancient fathers and mothers, we begin to see a fuller picture of this. In Abraham chapter 1, verse 2, Abraham records that in finding there was greater happiness and peace and rest for me, I sought for the blessings of the fathers and the right whereunto I should be ordained to administer the same. Having been myself a follower of righteousness, desiring also to be one who possessed great knowledge and to be a greater follower of righteousness, and to possess a greater knowledge, and to be a father of many nations, a prince of peace, and desiring to receive instructions, and to keep the commandments of God, I became a rightful heir, a high priest, holding the right belonging to the fathers. Abraham's beautiful desires here resonate with my heart and soul. And I think that there is Uh, an inkling here that many of us who have been reserved for this climactic time in history also have these similar desires. But what was it that Abraham was specifically alluding to when he says that he sought for the blessings of the fathers and to be ordained to administer the same? Corey talked a little bit about lectures on faith, so I won't review where these accounts come from, but I highly recommend us to all look them up. And they give, I think, the exact answer of what the blessings of the fathers were that Abraham was seeking. In Lectures on Faith, the second lecture, it says, after any portion of the human family are made acquainted with the important fact that there is a God, the extent of their knowledge respecting his character and glory will depend upon their diligence and faithfulness in seeking after him. 
until like Enoch, the brother of Jared and Moses, and I would add Abraham and Sarah, they shall obtain faith in God and power with him to behold him face to face. It was human testimony and human testimony only that excited this inquiry in the first instance in their minds. It was the credence they gave to the testimony of their fathers. This testimony having aroused their minds to inquire after the knowledge of God, the inquiry frequently terminated, indeed always terminated, when rightly pursued in the most glorious discoveries and eternal certainty. Joseph Smith and the others who collaborated on the lectures on faith are telling us that the blessings of the fathers that Abraham and Sarah sought was to see God face to face as had, as they had learned from their fathers and mothers was completely and totally possible. And as they recorded when that is rightly pursued, it has always resulted in that glorious discovery of seeing the face of God. So where do covenants come into this beautiful equation? Well, a covenant is the progressive pattern through which we develop this kind of direct relationship with God, the direct relationships that we have with our spouses, with our parents, with our children, where we see them face to face in the flesh. This is what our ancient fathers and mothers achieved and sought to teach their children to do as well. This is the object of the sealing power that was restored through the prophet Elijah, which is to turn our hearts to the covenant, this relationship, this progressive pattern of a direct relationship with God that was enjoyed by our fathers and mothers. And it empowers us to seek the same blessing. Our modern temples testify of this powerful reality. They depict the ascending pattern in every way possible throughout the building, the architecture, the structural design, the ordinance rooms, the ordinances themselves. Uh, we see a pattern of ascension until eventually we part the veil and return to the presence of God. And as we noted in that paradigm shift video for our new temple class that we just revealed, the veil is not a representation of death. There is no representation of death in the endowment ceremony. And so this is the culmination, the highest degree of covenant relationship that we can achieve with God in this lifetime. So let's talk a little bit about how we establish a covenant. Again, this is outlined in the temple pattern. We see this progressive relationship moving from one degree to the next, line upon line, increasing in light and knowledge, progressing back until we are admitted into the presence of God. The key to establishing this covenant has to do with the reception of ordinances. And ordinances include three key components. There is a physical sign that often has symbolic teaching associated with it. There is a law and there is a token. The spiritual component, that token, is a gift of grace that we receive directly from Jesus Christ. And it comes as a result of having made the appropriate sign, having understood and applied its symbolic teaching and living in accordance with the law associated with it. So as a quick example, let's look at baptism. The physical sign and symbolic teaching has to do with the physical ordinance of baptism, where you are dressed in white, you go down into the water, you are immersed completely into the water, and you are brought up again. There's symbolic teaching there that we learn that our lives, we are not meant to be sprinkling the gospel of Jesus Christ on us. Nor are we meant to be only taking piecemeal attempts at living a Christ-like life. Instead, we have to immerse ourselves. We go all in. We leave the world behind. We cover ourselves in Christ through his atonement. The law associated with baptism is the laws of obedience and sacrifice. And as we learn what those laws entail and apply them in our life, there will come the time when we are prepared and the Lord will bestow upon us directly a token, which is the baptism of fire and Holy Ghost in one interpretation. 
So that is an example. All three of those components are required for us to have received the entire ordinance. You must make the sign. You must apply the symbolic teachings and the associated law, and you must receive that beautiful token. As we receive these ordinances line upon line, we progress in our covenant relationship. At the very beginning, we are expressing our desire to God to be in a relationship with him. When we are baptized, that's the sign that we are making. We are saying, God, I believe that you are God and I desire to know you. As we move forward and receive all of that ordinance, we move into the next phase of a covenant relationship, which is a conditional covenant where the Lord has accepted us on the condition of our continued faithfulness and application of these true principles. And then all of this culminates in an unconditional covenant where we have proven faithful through all things. And the Lord has officially established that we are one with him, that our battles are his battles and that whatever we ask will be given by God. Now, our fathers and mothers went through these same progressive patterns, but they were shown in a little bit different imagery. So I want to talk about three particular covenant structures that our fathers and mothers moved through and how they line up with the ordinances and the covenants that we and the tokens that we expect and receive in our daily lives here in the latter days. Now, the first covenant structure was known as the Sinai Covenant. And we read about this in Exodus 19. It says, thou shalt say, then thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob and tell the children of Israel. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then shall you be my my peculiar treasure unto me above all people. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Now, the characteristics of a Sinai covenant, we have I think you've gotten a little bit of a taste of as you've listened to Corey this morning. The Sinai covenant was a covenant that was extended to a group of people rather than to individuals. And the goal of it was to collectively bring the body of the group into the presence of God. This is what Moses was trying to do on Mount Sinai. He was trying to prepare the people to bring them up Mount Sinai so that they could see God having achieved a likeness with him. And the original goal was that the people would be subject to the higher law, which is the reception of these spiritual ordinances, which is the law of sanctification, etc. Now, as we talked about today, that was not that was not successful at the time, unfortunately. Moses and the Israelites were not prepared. And we read a little bit about the transition that the Lord made. Instead of negating this covenant, you guys, this is so merciful of God. Instead of negating this covenant and saying, well, as a group, you are unprepared to come and to see me. Therefore, you have lost the opportunity as a whole. The Lord never said that. There was a transition made um, whereby the Lord continued to extend the opportunity to individuals, even though the group was not prepared. And we read some of this in Doctrine and Covenants 84, where it says, therefore, in the ordinances, think the spiritual ordinances, thereof the power of godliness is manifest. For without this, no man can see the face of God, even the Father, and live. Now this Moses plainly taught to the children of Israel in the wilderness. Plainly, that's interesting. Thinking back on Rob's presentation this morning, knowing that plain in a Hebrew sense meant a straight path. So the Moses taught this straight path to the children of Israel in the wilderness, and he sought diligently to sanctify his people that they might behold the face of God, but they hardened their hearts and they could not endure his presence. Therefore, he took Moses out of their midst and the holy priesthood also, and the lesser priesthood continued, which priesthood holdeth the keys of the ministering of angels and the preparatory gospel. So instead of negating this opportunity, which God certainly could have done, he transitioned and he made it available through different means. Now, there were a number of challenges that were were presented with the children of Israel and that resulted in this. Um, First off, they were inundated with false precepts and they were unable to identify the higher law of love. Instead, thinking that it was these outward things, it was these idols, it was these law of Moses performances that would be the things that would save them. 
and not realizing that the gospel of Jesus Christ at its heart is a transformation. It is becoming a new creature. It is learning to love like God is love. Now, the creation of the golden calf account that we read about when Moses came back down Mount Sinai and was trying to extend this opportunity to the children of Israel and finds that they have built a golden calf. And he goes to his brother and he's like, what are you doing? And he's like, I don't know. They just wanted to. And we look at them and we're like, oh, that's so silly. They couldn't. They're so dumb. Like they couldn't even last 30 seconds without Moses right there in their presence. What's interesting to me is that having known that these people had just been in Egypt for hundreds of years and that in Egypt, the creation of these idols was an earnest attempt for them to worship their gods. Um, I don't believe that they saw the idols as the God themselves, but it was the way that they had been taught to worship the true God. Uh, With that in mind, it seems to me that the children of Israel were actually earnestly attempting to worship Jehovah, who had just brought them out from captivity. However, again, they failed to recognize, as Rob talked about this morning, that they were meant to become the image of God, that it was not meant to be something external, but that it was meant to be something internal. We don't make graven images because we are supposed to become the image of God. And this was a key stumbling block, and it remained so for the children of Israel for quite some time. And you could argue till today, and you could argue that we have a similar challenge. So instead of becoming the kingdom of priests and priestesses and prophets and prophetesses, which is what Moses wanted to establish, instead they had a single representative appointed that would be an intermediary between them and God. Even then, eventually that sole representative was taken from them and the higher law and the holy priesthood after the son of God was temporarily forfeited on that group scale. And then, as we said, the Lord pivoted whereby the covenant would still be made available to individuals who learned the true pattern and applied it themselves. And this included the preparatory gospel, the preparatory priesthood, which operated within the laws of obedience and sacrifice. So let's talk about that preparatory gospel for just a moment. Again, going back to Doctrine and Covenants 84, it says, which gospel is the gospel of repentance and of baptism and the remission of sins and the law of carnal commandments, which the Lord and his wrath caused to continue with the house of Aaron among the children of Israel until John, whom God raised up being filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. Now, this is really beautiful because what we are learning here is that the preparatory gospel is revealed through the first principles and ordinances of the gospel that we have today. So it is meant to teach us the pattern by which we express that desire to be in a covenant relationship with God, the first step. As we talked about, the physical component in this instance is baptism of water. The laws that are associated with it is the law of obedience, not just obedience to the carnal commandments, although that's included, the Ten Commandments, the Word of Wisdom, those written in stone things that we tend to look to, but also obedience to the light of Christ, which is the spiritual ordinance that was given to each of us at the physical ordinance of birth. We learn to obey that as a personal iron rod to each of us in our lives And as we do so, the Lord will teach us to make sacrifices, not just any sacrifices, but appropriate sacrifices, the sacrifices that allow him and his atoning power to take action in our lives and to begin that transformation. And when the time is right in his perfect timing, we receive that spiritual component that it talked about, that these things continued until John, who was filled with the Holy Ghost. And now John shows us a pattern by which we move from the preparatory gospel again into the higher law, the higher gospel, the law of the gospel. And that's through the reception of the spiritual component completing this whole ordinance, which is the baptism of fire and the reception of the Holy Ghost. Now, the successful application of this preparatory gospel is how we, again, express that desire to be in covenant with God outwardly, and then we live it until the Lord knows that we mean it. And then he bestows that gift on us. And suddenly we are now in a new, a higher 
relationship. We are now in a conditional covenant with Jesus Christ. The pattern of a conditional covenant, I would say, could be represented through what we call the Abrahamic covenant. So in Abraham chapter one, we read, Abraham, Abraham, behold, my name is Jehovah, and I have heard thee and have come down to deliver thee and to take thee away from thy father's house and from all thy kinsfolk into a strange land, which thou knowest not of. Therefore, I have come down to visit them and to destroy him who hath lifted up his hand against thee, Abraham, my son, to take away thy life. Behold, I will lead thee by my hand and I will take thee to put upon thee my name, even the priesthood of thy father, and my power shall be over thee. Now, this is not the covenant that is established unconditionally between Abraham and the Lord after he agrees to offer up Isaac as a sacrifice. Rather, this comes shortly after Abraham had almost been sacrificed by his father to false gods. However, Abraham had already showed his desire, his obedience, his willingness, and his allowance of the atonement to transform him in his life. He had already received that blessed gift of the Holy Ghost and ministering angels came to rescue him from that ordeal. And so now we see that the Abrahamic covenant is where we begin to have this individual relationship with Jesus Christ, which was extended to us, even if the group has not had that opportunity or that opportunity has been removed from them. That was Abraham's inheritance. His family, had uh, they had um, inherited a corrupt Sinai covenant there had been a group apostasy and he was almost the victim of these sacrifices to false gods. But instead of turning away from God, instead of sorrowing at lost opportunities because of the conditions around him, Abraham turned to the Lord and determined to have an individual relationship with Jehovah himself. So he did, he inherited this conditional covenant that was still dependent upon his faithfulness and further transformation. And we see that, that after this point, the Lord calls Abraham and he begins moving him and moving him again and moving him again. And he is molding him through all of these experiences, through the sacrifices that he's asking him to make. He is sanctifying him. And at the same time, Abraham is qualifying and beginning to receive the blessings of this covenant relationship, where now he knows of the reality of Jesus Christ, even if he hasn't seen him yet. He has been so transformed by the atonement um, that it is a living, breathing reality to him. And he also has the opportunity to begin to administer the blessings that he has received of that conditional covenant to others in his family and household. Now, once you've moved into this place where you have an Abrahamic relationship, you have an Abrahamic covenant, an individual covenant with Jesus Christ, you will be inevitably prepared to pass an Abrahamic test as well. His test was recorded in Genesis 22, and it was the instance where he was called upon by God to offer up his son upon the altar of sacrifice. Again, recall that he had been placed on an altar by his father when he was younger. And so imagine the amount of trauma and stress and confusion that this test likely had for him. I believe he probably did a fair amount of healing before he was faced with this. And I'm sure the Lord accompanied him through that process. And in Genesis 22, we read, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and has not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. Abraham, in his faithfulness, proved to the Lord that there was nothing that would stop him from being loyal to Jehovah. Here we see more evidences of an ordinance, the physical, the law, and the spiritual components of it. Relating it to today, our physical components, the signs that we make, are seen in the temple when we make holy signs 
during endowment ceremonies. The laws that are associated are really fascinating for us to look at. They include the laws of the gospel and the law of chastity. Now, the law of the gospel, I think, is an interesting one to consider because there's so much that it could be including. I think more often than not, we tend to think of it as the first principles and ordinances of the gospel. However, we've already shown that those things are pretty well covered in our first ordinance of baptism. I think a more expansive way to look at the law of the gospel would be to consider it the higher law, this inward cleansing. In our temple class, I love how Corey talks about it as um, the Sermon on the Mount and learning to live the Sermon on the Mount as the Lord expounds on it in the New Testament and in the account when he visited the Nephites in the Book of Mormon. One thing that I know for sure, though, is that the living of the higher law requires us to be discerning. During this phase of our development of a covenant relationship with God, I have noted that there comes an intense and extreme number of spirits to compel us on the one hand and on the other. And it is not always easy to discern which spirits are of the Lord and which spirits are conspiring against us to prohibit our progression. However, this is not something that is avoidable. If we want to progress in our covenant relationship back to God, we have to step into that space. We have to learn to discern for ourselves. We cannot rely on somebody else's testimony or somebody else's relationship. And this is shown pretty clearly in the temple endowment. If you think about Adam and Eve, when they have been cast out of the garden of Eden, and they are now in this period of testing. They're in this earthly environment where there's tribulation, there's confusion. They are no longer in the presence of God. And they're praying and they're asking God to send us further light and knowledge. And Satan is the one who shows up first. And he says, what do you want? And they say, well, we want further light and knowledge. We want messengers from our God. And Satan says, oh, you want religion. That's not what Adam and Eve said they wanted. But it stumped them for a moment. They had to think about it. And then they had to say, "Mm, no, we're looking for messengers from our father to teach us. This is a true pattern. As we are moving through and developing this relationship with God, we will inevitably be faced with that kind of adversity. And what a great sign that we are moving forward. We have to believe that our Jehovah will come to us. And as it says here, that we will be his son and his daughter, that he will bless us, that he will multiply us, and that he will help us navigate through these tests. The law of chastity is another one that I think we often oversimplify by looking at it purely as a prohibition on extramarital sexual relations. Obviously, I think that's a big component of it. But even more broadly, considering where this is in developing this covenant relationship where we are bound to God and where we are one, where we are united, where we share in power and knowledge and glory, there's more to it than that. There's a lot more to it than that. Personally, one of the ways that I've come to think of the law of chastity is by relating it to the principle of meekness. And the best definition that I've ever heard of meekness is great power under control. Thinking about the propensity that we have as gods in embryo to wield great power and starting with where we are right now, exercising that level of self-restraint, that level of diligence, that level of control over our own beings, over all of our appetites, not just sexual but all of our physical appetites, all of our desires, bringing them into check, aligning them, putting them in right relationship with God. That I think is a better um, beginning of understanding all that the law of chastity might be requiring of us. Now, as we live these things, we are moving through a purification process where the Lord is burning out of us all of the residue, all of the ilk and the evil that comes with our fallen flesh. And that is challenging. (laughs) That is really hard. However, 
as we are proven faithful through all these things. In the Lord's timing, we will be blessed to receive that spiritual component, bookending this beautiful portion of our development of a covenant relationship with God. And that is called a calling and election made sure. That is the spiritual component of this level of ordinance. About this calling and election made sure, Joseph Smith said, after a person has faith in Christ, repents of his sins, is baptized for the remission of sins, and receives the Holy Ghost. So we've had the whole first ordinance, the physical, the law, and the spiritual components have been received, which is the first comforter. Then let him continue to humble himself before God, hungering and thirsting after righteousness and living by every word of God. The Lord will soon say unto him, son, thou shalt be exalted. And when the Lord has thoroughly proved him and finds that the man or woman is determined to serve him at all hazards, then the man or woman will find his calling and election made sure. This moves us into what I will call the third rung of this beautiful covenant relationship development between us and Jesus Christ. And that is called a Davidic covenant structure. So in Abraham 2 verses 8 through 12, we see that Abraham has now, after he's received his own promise of exaltation, um, he has now moved into a position where he can begin to turn around and administer those blessings to those who come after him. Here we read, my name is Jehovah, and I know the end from the beginning. And my hand shall be over thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, and thou shalt be a blessing unto thy seed after thee, that in their hands they shall bear this ministry and priesthood unto all nations. And I will bless them through thy name. For as many as receive this gospel shall be called after thy name, and shall be accounted thy seed, and shall rise up and bless thee as their father. I give unto thee a promise that this right shall continue in thee and in thy seed after thee, that is to say the literal seed or the seed of the body, shall all the families of the earth be blessed, even with the blessings of the gospel, which are the blessings of salvation, even of life eternal, which is to know God. Now, after the Lord had withdrawn from speaking to me and withdrawn his face from me, I said in my heart, thy servant has sought thee earnestly. And now I have found thee. So Abraham is now called to administer through his unconditional covenant with Jehovah to others. He ministers to his nephew, Lot. He saves his life and the life of his family. As he accepts this call to do so, to begin to turn around and to serve, to minister, which is to offer salvation, to those he is called to, he has promised that all of the families of the earth will be blessed through his relationship with Jesus Christ. And that is how we have the opportunity today to also take part in this beautiful development of a covenant relationship with God. It is because of Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Rebecca and Jacob and Rachel and all of their sacrifices, what they did to walk this path, to show us how to do it, and then to administer to us as well. In the Davidic covenant structure, we see an individual who has an unconditional covenant with Jesus Christ, who exercises that that covenant on behalf of a body of other people who otherwise don't have a covenant relationship with Jesus Christ. This used to be shown in the temple prior to some changes made over the last couple of years when Eve would covenant with Adam, who would then covenant with Jesus Christ. And at the time, as a woman, I'll tell you, it irked me. (laughs) I didn't like it. I don't think anyone did because in our modern view, we look at that and it looks like the woman is lesser and that she can't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Certainly that's not true. Instead, I think it was meant to show us this important principle, which is a Davidic covenant structure, that once we have an unconditional relationship with Jesus Christ, we need to turn around and offer that to others who don't. And that can be through a man or through a woman who has an unconditional relationship with Jesus Christ. Those in this covenant structure begin to serve as a proxy savior. 
answering for the sins of the people on their own person. King Hezekiah in the book of Isaiah is a beautiful example of this, where the people are going to be destroyed and he turns to the Lord with whom he has an unconditional covenant and he pleads for them to be spared. And the Lord does spare them, but King Hezekiah is sick, sick nigh unto death. In fact, he's going to die because he's taking the sins of the people upon himself. And the Lord graciously answers his plea to have his life extended and he is spared. We also see this in the Book of Mormon where Jacob is preaching to the people and he's saying hard truths, hard truths that he doesn't want to say and that they don't want to hear. But he says it. Why? Because he knows that if he fails to administer the blessings of a covenant to his people, that their blood will be answered upon him. And that that is not acceptable either, that they have to be brought into this covenant relationship at all costs. This structure is that of an emperor vassal structure. So if you know kind of the ancient um, administration of kingdoms, there was often an emperor who had all sorts of land and it was expansive and there wasn't the transportation and the communication that we have today. And so he would appoint vassals who were mini kings who would be over this area and who would be responsible for the people in that area. The idea is that the vassal, the people would adhere to the vassal who is the little king over their area and the vassal would report and obey directly to the emperor. And this is the same as a Davidic covenant structure is that we, when we move into this are meant to become that vassal that obeys our emperor, Jesus Christ. Again, we see a beautiful ordinance here. The physical component, again, showed in our modern temples, the law being the law of consecration. So thinking about that as so much more than an economic priority, um, this is so much more than tithing. This is so much more than just giving your house and your belongings to the church. This is about giving your heart and soul and your life to the Lord and then the Lord will have you give it to others. That is the law of consecration that we are working through here. And then the spiritual component as experienced by Abraham. And as we've been testifying about throughout this temple conference is known as the second comforter. Joseph Smith wrote about this in teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith. He said, there are two comforters spoken of. One is the Holy ghost as given on the day of Pentecost and the other comforter, it is no more or less than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And this is the sum and substance of the whole matter of the whole gospel of the whole covenant that when any man obtains this last comforter, he will have the personage of Jesus Christ to attend him or appear unto him from time to time. And even he will manifest the father unto him and they will take up their abode with him. They become a temple and the visions of the heavens will be opened unto them. And the Lord will teach them face to face. And they may have a perfect knowledge of the mysteries of the kingdom of God. And this is the state and place the ancient saints arrived at. When they had such glorious visions, Isaiah, Ezekiel, John upon the Isle of Patmos, St. Paul in the three heavens, and all the saints who held communion with the general assembly in the church of the firstborn. And certainly we can add our ancient fathers and mothers. We can add Mary Magdalene, who has a beautiful ascension vision. There are so many faithful men and women who have made this journey and the scriptures testify of that. And they invite us to do likewise. Herein we see so much value and mercy and beauty in the scattering of Israel. Because the Lord scattered those who had the covenant opportunity, they had rejected it at the time. But because he scattered them, rather than suggesting that the covenant was no longer pure and therefore could no longer be extended, instead, the Lord made the opportunity available to the whole world saying, if you have an ounce of Israelite blood, this is your invitation. A covenant is not an exclusive privilege for a select few. It's not even an exclusive privilege for just us. It is an open invitation to all people. And by scattering the blood of the fathers and mothers across the world, the Lord has allowed for all people to join in a covenant relationship and to become joint heirs with Christ. Now, the beautiful bookend of the scattering is the gathering. 
And in 3 Nephi 20, the Lord says, I will remember the covenant which I have made with my people. And I have covenanted with them that I would gather them together in mine own due time, that I would give unto them again the land of their fathers for their inheritance, which is the land of Jerusalem, which is the promised land unto them forever, saith the Father. And it shall come to pass that the time cometh when the fullness of my gospel shall be preached unto them. And they shall believe in me that I am Jesus Christ, the son of God, and shall pray unto the father in my name. For us becoming the seed of Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebecca, Jacob and Rachel does not only mean that we are baptized and become a member of the church. Rather, it means that we enter into a literal direct covenant relationship with Jesus Christ in this pattern, and then turn around and administer the blessings of that offer the gifts of salvation by teaching others that same pattern to become a children of the prophets in 3 Nephi 20, the Lord continues and behold, ye are the children of the prophets and you're of the house of Israel and you're of the covenant, which the Lord made with your fathers, saying unto Abraham and in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed and then shall be brought to pass that which is written awake Awake again and put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For henceforth thou shalt no more come into thee, the uncircumcised and the unclean. Shake thyself from the dust. Arise, sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose thyself from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. For thus saith the Lord, ye have sold yourselves for naught, and ye shall be redeemed without money. Verily, verily, I say unto you that my people shall know my name. Yea, in that day they shall know that I am he that doth speak. The children of the prophets are those who move through the same patterns that our ancient fathers and mothers moved through and those who obtained the same blessings that they did. This is the qualification to be numbered as a seed of Abraham and to begin administering the covenant in a Davidic capacity helping the Lord to fulfill all the elements of his covenant with the house of Israel. How is it that these will know Christ's name and that he is the one that speaks to them? It will be because they have received his name and they have heard his voice and they have seen his face that they can no more be deceived. This is a progressive relationship with God. This is a covenant. This is the essence of how we move from one degree of light into the next. This is the temple endowment. This is the pattern that the scriptures testify of and invite us to partake in. Moving through these specific covenant structures, obtaining the full ordinances associated with them, and being transformed through the atonement of Jesus Christ into new beings who can receive and retain the countenance of Jesus Christ in their own faces. The new and everlasting covenant, I love this from Doctrine and Covenants 22. It was actually shared in our Facebook group this week. It says, even that which was from the beginning, the new and everlasting covenant, even that which was from the beginning, Wherefore, although a man should be baptized an hundred times, it availeth him nothing, for you cannot enter in at the straight gate by the law of Moses, neither by dead works. Wherefore, enter ye in at the gate, as I have commanded, and seek not to counsel your God. The new and everlasting covenant is this path. It is moving through these covenant structures. It is receiving all three components of these ordinances and our lives matching and being formed into the image of God. Marcus B. Nash said that the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which embraces all ordinances and covenants necessary for the salvation and exaltation of mankind, is the new and everlasting covenant. It includes every contract, every obligation, every performance that pertains to the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise, which is that spiritual component of these beautiful ordinances that we're talking about here. According to the Lord's law, that is the new and everlasting covenant as defined by Joseph Fielding Smith. This covenant is new because it has been reestablished in each dispensation there has not been an apostasy from which the Lord has 
declared there can be no return. Instead, he offers it again and again and again. It was offered again by Joseph Smith, and it will be offered again leading into the millennium. It is everlasting because this is an eternal pattern. It is the same pattern that Adam and Eve participated in, and it will be the one that our children and grandchildren must participate in to experience that beautiful redemption, that salvation, and returning to the presence of God. We can apply it in the same fashion, and it will culminate in the same glorious results because God is not a respecter of persons. This is the path that he has laid out for us here today, and we are so blessed for the opportunity to partake in it. A key to doing that is to make this covenant by sacrifice. Again, in Lectures on Faith, I love these quotes. It says, it is in vain for persons to fancy themselves that they are heirs with those or can be heirs with them who have offered their all in sacrifice and by this means obtain faith in God and favor with them so as to obtain eternal life unless they in like manner offer unto him the same sacrifice. In the last days before the Lord comes, he is to gather together his saints who have made a covenant with him by sacrifice. Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous round about him. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant unto me by sacrifice. We cannot sit down with Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebecca, Jacob and Rachel, unless we are willing and have made the same offerings in righteousness that they have made. Latter-day disciples are those who will actively choose to offer whatever sacrifices may be required to ascend in a covenant relationship with the Lord until they behold his face and are empowered to do his mighty work of extending the blessings of covenant and salvation to others. These are kings and queens. These are the last laborers in the vineyard. These are the 144,000. I hope that these are us. We will face persecution and opposition. We have to. It's an inevitability, and it's a beautiful opportunity for us to sacrifice in like manner unto our beautiful fathers and mothers, all that they did for us to make this opportunity available to us. I am grateful for them. I have felt my heart turn to them as I have learned more about the covenant opportunities that I have been blessed with in my life because of them. I am inspired by them and I aspire to be like them. And above all else, I am so grateful to worship a God who is ever just and ever merciful, whose love is unyielding, is expansive, is beyond imagination, and which is available to all of us. And we are inseparable from that love. And that love came embodied to this earth in the form of Jesus Christ. I am so thankful for him as my savior, as my redeemer, as the God that I worship and the God who I hope to emulate in even my small capacity. I testify of the truth of these things. I have learned them for myself. And I pray that you will do the spiritual work to learn for yourselves and to experience the incredible blessings that come as you develop this beautiful personal relationship with God, which I testify they desire to have with you. Thank you all so much. In the days that are coming, the mountain stands high. Nations will rally under one sky. The house of the Lord, shining so bright, will guide his people out of the night. No more we fashion swords and do spears. The promise of peace, wiping our tears. His light will lead straight paths we will go. His goodness and mercy will know. Whispers of hope from valleys to seas Covenants united on bend and knees Echoes of promise where love is the fray Together we'll say Come, go up to the mountain of the Lord He the call our hearts deeply Loud 
Holding his promise so clear With every stride our purpose draws near Pressing, ascending the mountain we climb Each step takes us higher Whispers of hope